Mr. Lee, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I take the floor and the screen together. Uh, yes, as Paul says, um, I have had a an interest uh, which is pretty wide for a scholar. I guess you know, I started with uh, the English architecture and then thinking about Chinese uh, cities. Um, but in a way, uh, I do this out of no choice because our situations are very complex and not, uh, uh, today's world is, uh, is very global. Um, so um, uh, to maybe rein in the scope of the thoughts a little bit, then today we're gonna to talk about the idea of the Asian city as uh, Paul explained and we, uh, I probably I don't need to explain this uh, slide except to say that that I want to uh, highlight the fact that um, uh, it's not that Asian cities have disappeared and I want to argue that we have uh, been maybe too self-righteous to say that theories and ideas derived from research and study of one city or one kinds of city can be applied equally without too much thinking, uh, can be adapted to the study of another city. I want to argue that there's something quite distinctly different in different cities. And I want to argue that culture is what the city, uh, what makes um, the cities different, um, <clears throat> deeply, deeply different. Um, so uh, uh, this lecture is basically a call for a recognition of, of the implicit frameworks in urbanism derived from normative Western urban experiences as they are applied to cities in Asia. Um, I also want to tentatively suggest that there are ways of uh, recovery of alternative uh, resources in urban thoughts and practices. Uh, I'm going to talk through, as Paul introduced, three issues. Um, before that, uh, I want to quickly say that that uh, there, there has been a long historical process in which somehow, you know, of course, this is put in a uh, simplified way that Asian, the Asian city um, or, or, you know, the cultural traditions in, in Asia uh, have lost uh, their uh, prominence uh, in daily life. Um, so we think about the world from the Silk Roads, yeah, let's say from year 2000, 200 to, to 1600s, um, Clearly, the world had very diverse intellectual um, and cultural formations. Um, but since 1600s, with uh, the European navigation, uh, we are facing uh, with a development that the, the Emmanuel Wallerstein called the world system, um, basically a system of commerce uh, uh, with, of course, the uh, implementation and enforcement of military forces around the world. And that world system followed the European norms. And within that, very importantly, this is really thinking with Anthony Giddens, uh, that there has been a traditionalization of indigenous cultures, both in Europe and in particularly in Asia, in the sense that, that what there was kind of a creation of ancient traditions with the rise of modernity so uh so that creation framed uh previously functioning uh, cultural practices into traditions uh, when uh, <clears throat> and they are kind of opposed as the polar opposite of, of modernity so that kind of frames and, and marginalizes traditional culture. So what can we do today? And the work, uh, you know, it's, it's, this, this has been long in the making. I think the work today uh, has to go very deep and it's, a lot, it's going to be a long process. I want to argue that uh, here, that, um, that often traditions, uh, cultural traditions are portrayed as not being able to conceive the notions of freedom and it's uh, antithetical to science. Uh, 
uh, I want to say that, uh, and many scholars have been arguing that, that of course the Tao and the Brahma uh, are very much uh, uh, formulated to search for liberty and freedom, human liberty and freedom to arise above the shackles of, um, uh, uh, of life. Um, uh, so that's that's uh, deeply rooted in the search for freedom, science and civilization, uh, as uh, Joseph Needham uh, described, uh, uh, certainly can be found in many pre um, kind of modern uh, societies. Um, so so um, I th so I think I think Latour probably had it more or less right in the sense that the Western um, work, the greatest work of uh, Western civilization is not so much uh, about the creation of science, but more like the purification of science uh, that's at the center of the um, Western intellectual enterprise. So with that very simple um, kind of historical and philosophical uh, outline, and I want to move to the, the topics. And the first one I want to talk about is uh, is something that we largely take for granted in when we talk about the city. It is really about uh, the idea of owning land, and not only owning land, there's a particular kind of ownership, exclusive ownership of land, and the way in which uh, our hugely uh, complex um, uh, uh, legal frameworks are developed and formulated. Uh, to um, uh, to protect um, land ownership, um, so so this idea uh, is then pitched uh, against the idea of an inclusive land rights, um, and in the sense that land in many of the traditional societies are not understood as owned exclu exclusively, but more like kind of, you know, the edges are softer. And then sometimes uh, uh, people in uh, sociology or, you know, uh, uh, cultural studies think about this as bundles of rights. And this was in uh, medieval Europe and, you know, pre-modern Europe and, and also uh, very much in many parts of the world um, uh, in different cultures. Uh, C.B. McPherson uh, wrote a really interesting book of the possessive individualism to describe, to characterize the, the Western uh, kind of norm uh, in the sense that the idea, uh, the idea uh, that freedom is a function of possession is a very, very strong modern tradition and uh, land in that context uh, according to C.M. Han and, and, you know, of course, according to the normative practice has become the owning of land has become a, an archetypal form of property. Um, of course, there are many other kinds of property, but then it's somehow modeled on this archetypal form of uh, property ownership. Um, uh, so, so we talk about the city, we, you know, we, we have this kind of implicit framework of land and its improvement as city and architecture uh, as uh, defining features uh, of a free person um, and not in the sense of slaves and women in, in the Greek formulation. So land ownership, working in the background, defines a, a, a enormous large set of features of how we make cities. Uh, it's extensive, it really is the foundation of ex extensive legal framework define, defining construction and maintenance of cities. It is at the heart of an economic system based on uh, real estate and private enterprises. Uh, uh, in a way, a lot of our urban discourse and conferences and books are really about cities in crisis, and, and the crisis, uh, and many of the the sub the the, the um, topics that that we discussed today is are really related to the crisis of the public space that we're losing public space, uh, and and the private sector is kind of you know insidiously uh, encroaching the public uh, sphere, uh, and of course. 
the recent kind of neoliberalist privatization in the past three decades or four decades have not helped with this process. And we have privately owned public space uh, and, and uh, basically privatization of a lot of what we uh, would argue as the public good taking place. Um, I want to argue, uh, I hope uh, many of you are, agree that, that, that exclusive land ownership is not a global norm. It is a particular kind of cultural manifestation, a way of life that's kind of imposed through its influence uh, uh, throughout the world. And we just, you know, the, it, 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 it's a system that works and has a long tradition, but then uh, it doesn't, should not prevent us from, th from thinking about and seeking alternatives. Uh, McPherson himself said in a, in a very interesting conception is that, that land ownership is really not about uh, uh, an exclusive right to own, but more like a right not to be excluded. And that this, this distinction is, is uh, very important. Um, uh, you know, the pre-modern European societies had a strong notion of the commons. And today we have, uh, although, you know, this is a kind of uh, almost like a losing battle, I hope we don't lose the idea of the public good. Um, uh, what are they? So we can think about that. In traditional India, for example, land ownership uh, is far from being clearly defined. And you should read uh, Louis Dumont uh, on, on um, actually the cost, but, but um, uh, also land ownership. Um, uh, and, and one of the examples that I found really interesting is, is 1978 and Janata government in India kind of shifted from a, a definition of land as a fundamental right to a constitutional right and realizing that the British notion did not quite work in India and led to immense misery and suffering of people and the Chinese uh, um, uh, constitution does not recognize private land ownership, but more like land use right, uh, and and right to transfer land is um, is um, recognized. So um, I'm I'm really uh, talking about ideas very quickly. Uh, human life. Uh, um, we're really talking about the idea of land as more like if you think about it. Uh, a right not to be excluded idea, then we can think about uh, uh, land ownership in a, in a very different way. And I believe by taking that perspective, um, we, uh, we can, we can prob you know, we, we have the possibility of, of reframing uh, how cities can be, can be understood and it's no longer just about, you know, public and private uh, divide and its problems and, and the system, but more like thinking about uh, clustering of uh, people and the environment um, uh, in the interest of a larger ecological system. The second idea uh, that I want to talk about is uh, the idea of a normative status of labor. And for those who are familiar with the work of Marxists, and Mark, uh, Karl Marx or Marxist, uh, Marxism, um, the, the, the division of labor has been uh, a foundational concept for uh, Western society. And, and uh, along with that, of course, you know, I want to argue that the Western city consists of systems of typological spatial divisions, the zoning of cities and zoning laws, and that uh, is basically a, a spatial manifestation of labor types, the working class, bourgeois, uh, the bourgeoisie, and you know, the, the places that you live and work and, and, and your shop and, and entertain. Um, uh, uh, Hannah Arendt in The Human Condition kind of explained in one way quite clearly that, 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 um, that <laughs> uh, labor types matter in a moral sense uh, that, um, that that if you work you know she makes a distinction between work and labor you know work dignifies and labor degrades and so on you can trace that argument but it's very deeply rooted i want to argue that that 
this is not necessarily, again, a global norm. And the body, I think the global norm is publishing the body not being separated from its neighbor, the labor. It's really kind of understood together. And the Chinese notion of Lao, which is um, kind of closest where to resemble labor, uh, has never had a distinction between good Lao or bad Lao. You know, it's, it's work, it's more, you know, you do more or, or less, you know, it's like, uh, or, or you, you labor your mind or labor your body, Lao Xin, Lao Li. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, you find that uh, particular kind of quality uh, in Gandhi's conspicuous display of physical labor at the Gandhi ashram, uh, for instance. Uh, so so, so this, this is also something very important to consider. Uh, I want to argue that there might be a possibility of a shift in urban discourse from zoning, division of labor, division of zones to kind of human and non-human life systems, uh, from public-private dichotomy to cluster formations and from gated communities uh, of similar people to maybe a symbiosis of uh, complementary human uh, capabilities. The third one, uh, which is um, equally important, is the, the notion that, that the city uh, can be considered as transformative processes versus the city as constructional events. Um, this is really what uh, you know the primacy of architecture meant. I know this is really quite a uh, uh, maybe a kind of ex unclear and obscure notion, but but it is uh, very important in my mind. And the uh, I, I want to argue that the Western notion of the city. Uh, is heavily invested in the notion of architecture as an event, a rapture, like a Greek temple. You know, it's kind of standing there on its own uh, in defiance of its environment uh, as, a, as, as a distinction um, rather than as a continuity. So I want to talk about the idea of continuity. I want to talk about that, that, that a culture, a civilization that captures only ruptures it's not necessarily uh, uh, the only way, well, certainly not the only way, maybe not even the best way. Uh, so let's kind of think broadly and think about alternatives. And this is what this uh, section is all about. And I want to uh, take us to kind of think with the uh, French sinologist and philosopher, Francois Julien, who in a brilliant book called The Silent Transformations in 2009, uh, 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 argued that events of rupture, which is basically a, a way to define Western uh, cultural events, uh, are probably less revealing than silent transformations. You know, uh, when actually, what is the event of aging? Uh, Julian asks. Uh, this is really interesting question to think about. You only realize at certain moments, oh, wow, it's grown, you know, or you know, but but you don't really have an event. It's you know, it's that sense of a silent transformations uh, that 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 is more important to understand. And of course, he's of course using Chinese more and ascetic traditions uh, to think about that uh, non-rapture. Uh, ruptured uh, events and thinking about um, uh, maybe we can expand that on Taoism as a non-ontological thought. Uh, if you think about ontology as uh, a uh, as a way of thinking about the identity and the being of things, uh, Taoism is quite the opposite of that. You know, it deals with processes and not identities and ruptures and events. Um, uh, so, so that is that, and 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 thinking along in this direction, I want to argue that garden landscapes have a far more important role in the conception of Chinese cities in the traditional sense, not in the sense that that's being practiced today. I think it's uh, it's a little um, um, skewed, and we'll come back to that point later. Uh, if the city is not really focused on constructional events, 
and it is then open to reformulate itself as garden landscapes and uh, the garden landscape or the Chinese notion of sanctuary uh, is um, uh, well, it was a, a very important guiding principle and it was certainly uh, not in any significant way related to the West notion of property ownership and zoning uh, and, and, and that really is a very interesting um, way um, that we can develop. Um, so uh, a number of projects can be developed from any of these three lines of investigations and certainly uh, uh, over here there has been a program to develop that uh, in, in, in the foreseeable future. And I want to um, maybe use one uh, kind of research program as a case study uh, to um, maybe illustrate what I meant uh, when I discussed this, uh, <laughs> you know, deep alternatives, uh, uh, additional resources, uh, let's put it that way, and there's no intention of replacing um, the enormously uh, important um, achievement of the Western urban um, tradition uh, or urban urbanism, um, but more like kind of, you know, what else can we think about uh, uh, in terms of the nature uh, of the city? Uh, so, so the case study is called Garden Landscapes. Is it's actually the, the 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 existing title is Garden Landscapes as thought language, and I want to here talk about garden landscapes as conception of the city. And it really, in order to explore that idea in a um, uh, proper, in a kind of appropriate depth, and we really need to go back to how the Chinese language is formulated. And what you're looking at here is a, what I would argue, like a continuum of thought, language, things, garden, landscapes, as one thing that has not lost its shape. You know, it is really a, a kind of, there's a shape continuity here. Uh, you see that this is very different from the phonetic languages, uh, alphabetic, um, uh, languages that that represent reality very very differently. We're looking at here, of course, you know, and I hope we all understand that this is the Chinese word mountain, and that's how you know the 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 um, etymology. If that's the etymology, that's how the word developed over history. Uh, how mountain is represented in painting and how it appears in gardens and how, you know, such. So, so there's a continuity there. Um, so one looks at this garden, this is Wang Shiren in Suzhou. Um, what, what, what are we thinking? Or what did the literati who built this garden, and it started in the Ming Dynasty, uh, uh, 1600s, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, so, so what is it that we're looking? So I want to argue that you're actually looking here, not just a kind of beautiful view of a landscape, but it is actually uh, like a combination of thought, thing, language. So it is, uh, it, it's, it's philosophy as much as it is uh, tree species and fish in the pond. Um, so, uh, if you actually look at how traditional Chinese uh, literati represented these gardens, and they didn't really just go and paint a view very much unlike the landscape picturesque tradition uh, in the West, but they actually did a more like kind of what they, you know, what the garden could bring them in terms of thinking. Uh, so this is Wen Zhengming's, uh, this is a, a 16th century painting of a Chinese garden, uh, Zhuo Zhengyuan. Uh, I mean, this is of course not a garden, but you know, he's, but, but it, it, 
he was actually trying to capture the spirit of that, which is really uh, uh, was done through a, a visual as well as a piece of poetic writing. So you can see the connection between these two. So what I would want to argue that the writing here is no longer just a uh, uh, representation of signs or something, they become part of the forms. You know, you never lose the shapes of things when you go through uh, this thinking process. So uh, it's, it just give you some examples of how, you know, if you think this, I mean, to me, this is kind of both a writing as well as a piece of rock, uh, as well as a natural uh, kind of hard material um, that we can find. So, um, <clears throat> but, I mean, I was educated to study Chinese garden and never to look at these writings that's pasted around and just so many words in the garden. And in, in a way that maybe my teachers were too interested in kind of making orthographic, orthographic uh, projections of Chinese gardens. And I look at it, I mean, just, you know, we have to be kind of uh, facing the actual um, kind of reality of Chinese gardens and you cannot dismiss them. They are everywhere. They're actually defining how you understand the, uh, the garden and taking you to all kinds of places, historical, philosophical, poetic, and just they're pasted all over. And this is uh, George and Yang. And uh, so if you look at this and remembering all the words that you have been exposed on the way to this spot, you would think very differently. So this is really uh, not just kind of view, but more like, a text, uh, uh, simultaneously a view and a text. Uh, out of desperation um, <laughs> for my uh, um, uh, understanding the Chinese city, uh, I wanted to do uh, a representation of, maybe I do a drawing of Chinese garden and I call it the layered approach, uh, which is a very different from, you know, a orthographic. It, this is actually about the same garden. This is Zhou Zhengyan. Um, orthographic plan projection, which um, I was educated in, and also the traditional um, um, representation method. So, uh, so certainly I kind of reintroduced the words, uh, maybe not by making it like a, you know, axonometric uh, drawing. Um, I hope you know, we don't lose the accuracy of the representation, but um, but bringing back some uh, deeper layers that, that have been uh, basically casted out um, from our um, normative understanding of the Chinese garden. Um, the um, discussion of language is enormously important. And uh, this is really, uh, something that, that I've been uh, uh, reading and thinking uh, with the, um, the work um, published by David Anthony on language um, and civilization uh, and, and uh, realize, well, I mean, uh, thinking about how our world you know, thinking about this kind of traditionalization of Asia and how the world had become so predominantly um, uh, alphabetic and, and, and phonetic. Uh, uh, if you look at the world language map and you realize that that, that red uh, triangle that, that I, I put on the map of uh, language families indicates a divide between uh, pre predominantly Indo-European languages and the Sinitic language that had maintained, managed to maintain a little corner of the world uh, as, as an alternative, maybe. Um, you know, it's helped by maybe the Great War and the Taklamakan Desert um, and, the, and the Himalaya mountain range uh, to have kind of stopped the bread, spread of the Indo-European language that you know, I had gone to uh, Northern India instead to China. So if you look at the, the I, mean, I don't want to go to details here, the, the, except to say that this is actually David Anthony's map of 
uh, how Indo-European languages spread and how actually a particular kind of civilizational format spread around the world. And this format, uh, thanks to uh, studies in, in structuralism, uh, has now been uh, primarily represented in, in this way. Uh, uh, the idea that if you actually want to capture the meaning of something, you use a sign. This is different from Chinese. The Chinese uh, language does not use a sign. It, they, it uses a shape. Uh, so so, uh, so there's the, the divide between signifier, signifier, and referent, and the way in which uh, meaning is created is uh, basically uh, grounded in the use of signs and a system that differentiates signs. So it's, it's kind of relatively divorced from the shape of things. And this is an anxiety that, that Leibniz and you know, so many uh, European philosophers have uh, worried about. And they think that you know, by extracting the sign, you actually lose contact with the thing. Um, so, so the sign uh, economy that's <laughs> is, is really kind of intertwined with uh, a way of thinking. You know, we call it structuralism. Uh, in this particular context, I would like to call it a grammar-based logic of sound mechanics, and which is really the change of form of words, uh, insertion of grammatical differentiations uh, that, that marked uh, probably the sharpest difference between Sanskrit and Chinese. Um, and this is something that, that, that Derrida also mentioned. Uh, by the way, I mean, Derrida didn't invent that you know, problematic. And it's just uh, interesting that, that he injected that uh, in the book of, of grammatology uh, in relation to the primacy of grammar. So what does that mean for architecture? So Western architecture, this goes all the way back to my PhD research and, you know, Palladianism, grammar, grammatical design, you know, uh, uh, shapes and permutations of shapes, shapes based on some kind of syntactic, syntactical rules, uh, you know, Duran, uh, you know, George Steiner and, and William Mitchell, the Palladian grammar that was uh, at one time um, uh, <clears throat> formulated uh, at the MIT, pattern language, Christopher Alexander, um, space syntax and this is Bill Hillier and Julian Hansen at Bartlett and thinking about how you know it's a, it's a, there's a whole set of including the kind of post grammar design which is really kind of inserting difficulties in the grammar a bit like uh, Derrida uh, sense uh, so Lipskin and uh, uh, so so this whole enterprise of grammatical differentiations and rules and permutations are grounded in the idea that the city is made of constructional events and these construction events have rules behind them and these rules are to be uh, found in some kind of structuralist thought uh, that then uh, can be uh, translated into uh, uh, a knowledge of shapes and that gives rise to the city. So and both architecture and the city are, uh, can be or very often understood in that way. Um, sorry, I should uh, stop, uh, go back to this slide uh, in, in the sense that so, um, so with regard to the third theme, uh, thinking about alternatives, uh, this is really where um, the Chinese traditional practice of mountain water cities, Shanshui, Chengshi, as, as a possible uh, way to think outside uh, um, the sound mechanics and you know, uh, grammatical understanding of uh, cities um here 
Well, there are two aspects to this, and one is the the critique of uh, um, of Western scholarship of you know the Chinese city not getting the grammar right, and the second is um, really uh, the understanding in a completely different sense of what city what the city should be about, and here. Uh, grammar is probably least significant, uh, um, and this is a, a, a area view of Hangzhou, um, uh, arguably one of the most kind of desirable tourist destinations, and this is the West Lake. And so this is a lot of love in the Chinese culture for this place. And what is it so special about it? You know, if you think about it, it is water and mountain. You know, it's Shanxi. It's really it's that sense that that both a city and uh, a garden landscape can be merged together. I mean, like there's certainly a lot of failures in the city, but then the success is also quite apparent. And and this is um, uh, demonstrated in the affection of the people for this place. They would go next to the lake and sing and dance you know and eat and and it's just really uh, there's a lot of happiness in uh, living in a place like this and um, so um uh, this is a picture that that I, that I took with um um actually run a travel study research um, program with esther lawrence um, uh, here and these are our students <laughs> sitting next to the lake and you know maybe trying to contemplate what I told them to uh, think about. So um, uh, so we're um, back to this notion of looking at architecture, not as the being of buildings and cities and in the Greek sense, but more like the between of material and ecological systems. Not that we need to neglect how buildings are built and building technologies and so on, but more like how do you understand what makes it? Um, in the sense also to understand how, you know, that practice, uh, even if it's not intellectually explicitly articulated, come out in contemporary Chinese designs and how we can actually kind of give it a voice, give it a way to kind of improve itself uh, uh, rather than just kind of do it in a, um, in a kind of haphazard way. Um, so so that's, that's, a, that's a cultivation, it's development of a culture, uh, of an urban culture. And if I look at the places like that, and this place that, that certainly has a lot of writing, has a lot of aspirations, and you know, it's, it's a shopping street in the city of Changsha, um, uh, and it's differently conceived from the Western city. Uh, lastly, I want to show you a, an example of uh, some kind of consultancy that Esther Lawrence and I took uh, part in. A, an experiment in China, in China, the city of Xiong'an, uh, a master plan uh, for 2018 to 2035 as probably the next paradigm of Chinese uh, city design. Uh, this is, you know, the equivalent maybe of Washington DC, uh, like with a lot of government functions uh, uh, being imagined to be relocated in this uh, place, not very far from Beijing. Um, but it's next to a lake. So, so, so the master plan by Tom Leader Studio in San Francisco and SOM, which uh, has been selected as the winning scheme, um, uh, we we spent quite a bit of time talking with uh, Tom Leader Studio, who is the lead designer in this case, uh, about how to think about the mountain water city. You know what what could it be? You know. So, so it really has become not the city of constructional events, but more like construction, uh, more like a city of processes. And these processes are actually reflected in seasonal changes. So the Chinese conception of seasonal changes are very vivid. You know, it's really about 24 um, uh, uh, time 
uh, related uh, weather events. Um, and it's in Chinese calendar. The Chinese calendar does not have saints and distinguished persons. And they're not marked, not marked by Jesus Christ or, you know, this and that human characters, um, but more like kind of marked by seasonal events. So this is really uh, a very interesting thing to think about. Uh, another uh, outcome is, is this uh, special issue that I'm editing with Scott Lash called Against Ontology, China and Francois Julien. And we want to get uh, a whole range of really prominent philosophers to think about uh, the philosophical side of what I just described to you, um, to think outside ontology. Is it possible? If it is possible, uh, if we think with China, uh, how, how does it look? You know, so, so my contribution is called Cotton Landscapes as Thought Language, um, uh, but, but there's a whole range of other um, discussions um, bringing back to um, uh, examples of kind of European philosophers wishing to think outside ontology, but then somehow with, without the access of a uh, social, physical, total fact of um, uh, um, of the um, uh, Asian city um, that that we now have access to. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I think I'm run a little bit over the time, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee, for a very thought-provoking